Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nancy Melinda, Communications Manager for the Aluminum Extruders Council. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Specifying Aluminum Extrusions, Understanding the ASTM B221 and B221M Standards, presented by Greg Lee of Hydro Aluminum. Our presenting sponsor is Futura Industries. Futura is one of the top aluminum extruders in the world and delivers customized start to finish aluminum extrusion services. All computer audio and telephone lines are muted. So if you have a question during the webinar, please select Q&A or chat from the toolbar. Type your question in the dialog box and our presenter will address your questions at the end of the presentation. Following our webinar, an email will be sent to you. We ask that you take a moment to answer the brief survey about today's presentation. This course has been registered with the American Institute of Architects for continuing professional education. Credits earned by completion of this course will be reported to AIA CES for AIA members. Today's webinar will cover specifying aluminum using the ASTM B221 and B221M standard. ASTM B221 and B221M is a material specification standard for aluminum extruded bars, rods, wires, profile, and tubes. The requirements are in place to give the purchaser confidence that the product is produced to their expectations and are consistent with the same products regardless of the producer. This webinar provides an overview of the ASTM standard and walks through pertinent sections to help the learner better understand the ordering process for aluminum extrusions when ordering to an ASTM standard, and it explains what to expect from the manufacturer. At the end of this course, you will be able to cite where, the, where to find the ASTM standard document, recognize which products are covered by ASTM B221, and B221M, describe which ordering requirements have to be specified and which are implied, and explain how to handle issues that are not covered by the standard. Now it brings me pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Greg Lee is an aluminum industry veteran with over 22 years of experience working with aluminum billet casting and extrusion. Greg has a BS in Metallurgical Engineering from the University of Missouri Rolla, now Missouri S&T, and an MS in Material Science from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He is currently a Regional Sales and Technical Manager for Hydro Aluminum headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. Greg has been the shepherd for ASTM B221 and B221M since 2000. Now I'll turn the, the Sorry, right, now I'll turn the webinar over to Greg. Greg, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Um, yes, today's presentation is on uh, ASTM B221 and B221M. Um, uh, its usefulness is often defined uh, by the user. It is a uh, standard specification uh, but for engineers and designers, uh, it is a uh, material spec. It, it contains uh, chemistries, mechanical properties, testing requirements, um, uh, all the uh, information that you'd need for specifying a product. Uh, it is also a specification for purchasing. You can purchase aluminum extrusions without, specif without specifying B221 requirements, of course, but if you want to use B221 or 221M, uh, section 4 in the standard outlines all the information someone would need to clarify uh, with the supplier to avoid misunderstandings. It is largely those items that we will discuss in today's presentations. Furthermore, B221 clarifies how products are to be processed uh, by, the, by the manufacturer uh, and what expectations should be had by the purchaser. It, specifies, uh, it also specifies certain equipment and quality requirements uh, to produce the products. So here's some things that you should know about B221. Just as an overview, B221M is the metric version of B221. 
uh, other than the units, it's virtually the same as B221. If I say something about 221 in this presentation, the same will hold true for B221M, unless I'm, of course, talking about properties. Uh, B221 is the uh, most common standard for aluminum extrusions, so, if it, uh, so it's updated more often than the other standards, uh, usually every couple of years. Uh, the version is identified by a two-digit number after the standard number. So, for example, uh, V221, uh, the current version is dash 14. So the dash 14 means that the most recent update of standard was approved in 2014. Uh, the version uh, should be identified when the standard is referenced. So if you order to the standard, uh, please include the version number that you, that you intend. It is uh, possible to still reference older versions uh, if, um, if you want the product to be made to an earlier revision. Um, and if you erroneously pick the, uh, the previous version, um, <clears throat> that is the product uh, requirements that you would be asking for. Uh, so, what else should you know about the standard? Well, where do you get it? Um, all ASTM standards are available at uh, www.astm.org. They can be ordered online, uh, downloaded, or you can have hard copies sent to you. Uh, you. You can get the standards individually, but uh, most of the reference standards, and there are several reference standards in, in each of the, uh, of the standard specifications, most of those reference standards will be uh, also available in the section two, volume 2.02. So I recommend go ahead and uh, getting the entire uh, volume rather than just the individual uh, standard. Uh, another way to, uh, to get the standard is to get involved. Uh, membership for ASDM is less than the purchase cost of the volume. And you get a volume of your choice with your membership. Uh, so over a couple of years, you can uh, develop quite a, a library of ASTM uh, standard volumes. Uh, you also stay up to date on changes as they're being made, and uh, your say will be heard so, uh, so that we get your input and in future changes to the standards. Now let's talk about the scope of B221. Each standard has a well-defined scope. Uh, B221 covers basic extrusion shapes, including bars, rods, wires, profiles, and tubes. In other words, general application extrusions. There are, there are other uh, specifications that are more appropriate for certain specific applications, and B221 usually directs you, actually directs you to these specifications. Uh, in other words, uh, if you what you really want is a rolled or a cold finished bar or rod. Uh, B221 uh, <clears throat> will direct you to uh, ASTM B211. If you want a drawn seamless tube used in pressure applications, B210. Uh, structural pipe and tube, look at B429 uh, or 429M. Or seamless pipe and tube used in pressure applications, uh, B241 and, B2, or, uh, and B241M. Thing is, uh, B221 is really not appropriate for certain fluid carrying applications involving pressure. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, users of the standard still want to use B221 for some tubes with seams, but used in those applications. So um, B221 does have the following disclaimer. Pipe and tube products listed in the specification are intended for general purpose applications. The specification may not address the manufacturing processes, integrity testing, and verification required for fluid carrying applications involving pressure. Then once again, it directs you to the standards um, that are more appropriate for those types of uh, uses. Ordering extruded products using B221 is relatively easy as everything that needs to be included in the ordering information is laid out in section four, ordering information. Every characteristic or requirement for the material covered in section four has a section or a reference standard that explains the requirement. 
Not every aspect is automatic just because the standard is used. Some aspects have to be called out specifically, such as certification or marking. Occasionally, the item calls out that the issue has to be agreed upon between the purchaser and the producer to avoid disputes later. And that's one of the advantages of, of ordering using B221 is that it, it was written uh, based on experience with um, uh, issues that would have been uh, much easier to resolve if they happened ahead of time rather than after the product's already been delivered. Section four has a long list of items to be considered when purchasing uh, products using B221. Uh, I've tried to simplify this as much as possible. If, if you have the standard, you go to the standard, you'll see uh, quite a long list um, of, of items to be considered, but uh, I've broken those down into three separate parts. Uh, first, you start with the basic information. Um, okay, this is uh, basically the specification designation as we discussed before, uh, the quantity in pieces or pounds, uh, the alloy that you want, you select that from uh, section seven and table one, um, the temper, uh, which is uh, discussed in section eight and uh, table two, and we'll go through all of these uh, a little bit more um, as we go through this. And then also in 4.1, uh, it discusses the size and the shape of the part that you're, uh, that you're purchasing. So let's, let's go through size and shape real quick. Uh, when extrusion profiles are ordered, a dimension drawing usually accompanies the order. Drawings are not required for simple shapes. Uh, in those cases, the following cross-sectional dimensions are required. Okay, so if you're if you're just wanting something very simple like a, a rod or a round wire, you can say I want a rod with this diameter. Uh, if you want a square cornered bar or wire, this is the um, this is the depth and the width of the of the product that I want. And it, and it goes on, as you can read here, um, but if it's uh, like a hexa uh, hexagonal bar or an octagonal bar, then it's just the distance across the flats or round tube. It's uh, the diameter and wall thickness, uh, so on and so forth, um, square or sharp corner tube. Other than round, it's the distance across the flats and wall thicknesses. Uh, but in general, most uh, most of the time you will provide a drawing. Even if it's one of these, sometimes it just helps with clarification. But uh, if it is anything beyond those listed uh, uh, there uh, from 4151 to 4155, uh, you should use a drawing. Another thing about the shapes is that you should keep in mind that all of this, uh, that there are standard tolerances for all of these dimensions. Uh, the NC tables uh, are, are given where all of these standard tolerances are, are listed, whether, um, and that is given for each type of product, dimension characteristic. And these are all listed in section 15. And uh, the ANSI, ANSI tables, normally you'd have to go out and buy those separately, but that's one of the nice things about volume 2.02 is it's actually included uh, in, in, the, uh, in the volume and um, that makes it a lot easier to have one book that has all of these, all the information in it. And keep in mind, you can order non-standard tolerances, uh, but anything non-standard has to be negotiated uh, with the producer. Uh, going back to the rest of section four, we look at section 4.2, and that uh, contains um, a lot of information Beyond uh, uh, beyond the basics, okay. So it will go through heat treatment options, and we'll discuss all of these later. Uh, inspection and witnessing of the inspection, whether certification is required, uh, whether marking for identification is required, um, whether packaging uh, in accordance with B six six zero is required. Um, requirements of tensile testing and dimensional tolerances for sizes not specifically covered. So you have the option to uh, spec 
products, uh, product dimensions that are outside of uh, what exists in V2.2.1. And then it gets a little bit more complicated if you're ordering some higher strength products like uh, 2000 series and 7000 series, uh, because there are some algorithms that uh, that can be used uh, by the producer, but they need uh, your permission to use those uh, footnotes. Anyway, that's just a, an overview. I know it's <clears throat> a lot of stuff to consider uh, when you're purchasing um, you know, extrusions to the standard, but it is all laid out uh, step by step. And then each of these items have a corresponding section. So uh, that's more or less what we're going to uh, work through right now. Um, section five is very simple. Um, and as I go, go through this, uh, I will point out which sections uh, are referred to in the um, purchasing instructions. Um, ones that aren't uh, will be um, ones that aren't actually mentioned in the purchasing specifications, but that just means that they're standard and um, assumed to be part of the product uh, requirements uh, of B221. Uh, just give me an example, uh, give you an example here. Uh, in section five, uh, it points out, it's a very small section, it points out that the product uh, has to be produced by the hot extrusion process or equivalent, that's a given. Um, Section six, on the other hand, uh, it, it mentions whose responsibility it is for the, the inspection. And it uh, designates that the producer is responsible for the inspection. However, it allows that, uh, that the purchaser can reassign that responsibility. So uh, if you prefer a third party uh, do the inspection or you wanna do the inspection yourself, uh, you can uh, call that out in the contract, or that is something that can be negotiated. Uh, section six also goes on to define uh, what a lot is, because uh, these are lot inspections. And uh, the definition for, um, for a heat treated product uh, is different than that for a non-heated product, uh, as far as what we determine uh, is a lot, so. Section seven uh, covers chemical composition of the alloys, uh, as well as how to verify chemistries and how to settle disputes. Uh, the alloys that are listed are typically those listed uh, in the aluminum standards and data. Now, uh, not all always, but uh, currently uh, that is the case. Um, aluminum standards and data is the main uh, reference for uh, for B221 chemistries. Uh, and uh, we do our best to make sure that those chemistries and those uh, are, are conform to the chemistries in the aluminum standards and data, just to avoid confusion. Um, so the chemistry of the products that you order must conform to the limits set out in uh, table one in uh, B221. Uh, I'll show an example of what B221 looks like in the next slide. Uh, typically, billet chemistry is checked to be in conformance prior to extruding the billet. So um, the extruders will, uh, are, are supposed to get chemistries from the billet producers. Uh, it's up to them to ensure that what they get uh, is in conformance. Sometimes they actually check the chemistry themselves with their own uh, uh, acceptance procedure. Uh, but it requires extruders to um, be responsible for the certificate of analysis. Uh, and then that chemistry of the extrusions, when they use those uh, billets, then they link the extrusions to, um, to the chemistry of the billets used. Now, um, I mentioned <clears throat> sometimes disputes come up. And uh, this is just a, a fact of life when it comes to chemistries. Uh, this, this happens often because the, uh, if the user wants to confirm the chemistry of the extrusion, and if they use like a, a common spark test, for example, 
uh, sometimes the chemistries do not match well with the um, melt analysis that's on the certificate of analysis. So um, one of the things that B221 points out is that the spark test is not an accepted method for checking or rechecking extrusion chemistry. Uh, the, uh, there are better ways to check the chemistry that can be, uh, that need to be agreed upon in advance. So when it is necessary to confirm chemistry extrusions, the retest procedure uh, is outlined uh, in the standard. There are ways that are accepted and if the purchaser wants uh, to use a different method, then that needs to be called out in advance. Um, now, Section 7 also requires the extruders to create traceability of the extrusions uh, and to keep their records uh, typically three years. However, it is possible um, for, the, uh, for the purchaser to require that, uh, that length of time to be longer. Now, um, as promised, here's, a, uh, here's an example of Table 1. This, uh, this exists in B221 and 221M. Uh, there's just no difference between the, the two standards as far as uh, this goes um, because the, the numbers are in weight percent. Um, it does not include uh, all the footnotes. You'll see some references to footnotes, but uh, those you can find in B221, and uh, there are about a page and a half of, uh, of footnotes. But as you can see, uh, the, these are the alloys that are covered by 221, and uh, there will be uh, more alloys added um, all the time. Moving on to Section 8, uh, tensile properties. Now, tensile properties um, are often confusing. Uh, some of these requirements, um, well, uh, sometimes they need to be clarified, but the standard for tensing, uh, tensile test uh, frequency is outlined in 8.2. Um, uh, profiles that uh, we, we consider relatively light or less than a pound per foot, we take one sample per 1,000 pounds. Uh, now keep in mind that you take a tensile test sample for the first 1,000 pounds. So if you are ordering, for example, 3,000 pounds, then the, uh, the manufacturer will take three samples for tensile tests throughout the run. If, uh, if it's 3,500 pounds or anything over 3,000 pounds, uh, up to 4,000 pounds, then you take four samples. Uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of confusion about that. Now, uh, if for heavier sections, uh, profiles that we can uh, would say are, are, are over a pound of, per foot. You take one sample per 1,000 feet. So uh, heavier shapes, you uh, from a weight standpoint, you'll end up with less samples, but it's still considered uh, representative of that one, you know, of that part of the order. And the same thing goes, you take one sample for the first 1,000 feet. Elongation uh, results. Um, now, when you do a tensile test, you get yield strength, tensile strength, and uh, elongation, uh, which is a measurement of ductility. Uh, however, uh, elongation results are not valid on material thinner than uh, 62 thousandths uh, for uh, an extrusion wall or for a wire less than uh, uh, 0.125 inches or 125 pounds diameter. Uh, it's just not enough material there to give you uh, an accurate measurement on elongation. Okay, um, now the procedure that's set out, this, this is a standard procedure. If you want to go with more testing or if the history of the product uh, has been good and uh, you're looking for uh, ways, you know, to uh, reduce perhaps, uh, you know, the uh, to save, to, you know, look for savings or look for uh, opportunities. 
uh, you can use other procedures. Uh, and it really is up to you and, uh, and the manufacturer. Um, now, all these tensile specimens are processed in accordance with uh, ASTM B557. Uh, that standard shows how to take the tensile samples where, from where in the samples they, uh, the, the test bars should be taken. And it also has a procedure for evaluating a stress strain curve. So now when referencing, um, you know, the required properties, uh, these are all in terms of uh, tempers. So uh, here's uh, an excerpt from table two. It shows a fairly common 6,000 series alloy uh, and some of the tempers that um, would are listed in B221. Um, and as you can see, uh, for each temper, you have a specified uh, wall thickness uh, or section thickness um, that, uh, and to be clear, you, sometimes you do have different required properties uh, based on, um, on wall thickness. Uh, elongation, for example, uh, requirements often change uh, based on how heavy the wall is. And uh, I also want to point out that, um, you know, these are, uh, if you look, for example, uh, T51 up to 0.625 inches. So that's the highest uh, thickness that, uh, for which there were properties when this alloy is registered. Uh, if you're ordering something that is thicker than that, you have to specify or clarify with, uh, with the manufacturer that, um, uh, you know, what properties you expect. For example, if you still expect those same properties, then you need to call that out in the purchase spec. Okay, uh, section nine is on heat treatment. And this is probably one of the more confusing, complicated parts uh, of the standard. So I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time on this. Um, and if you have some questions as, uh, as was called out earlier, uh, just, you know, uh, just send them to me um, either at the end of this presentation or get hold of me later on. But uh, I, I imagine that there could be some, uh, some questions from, from this. Now, this, uh, this part um, on basic temper designations, it comes from ANSI 35.1, but I want to make sure that, um, you know, we cover some of this because without understanding what these things are, then section nine uh, won't make as much sense to, uh, to you. Um, and if you already know this stuff, I, I apologize, but I wanna make sure that we cover it. All right, so uh, when you're looking at uh, temper designations, uh, sometimes you'll have an F, um, in other words, say a 6061F, that means as fabricated. Uh, it applies the products uh, of a shaping process, which, you know, hot extrusion is a shaping process, but uh, there are no requirements for uh, thermal control uh, so or uh, strain hardening. So it basically is as produced, as fabricated. Um, and uh, sometimes that's, uh, that's desirable because you know that you're going to buy it, you're going to take it, and you're going to do something with the part, and you'll end up heat treating it yourself later. Uh, o means annealed, and that uh, applies to rock products, and it, these are annealed to obtain the lowest uh, strength temper. Um, and, the, and the purpose is to improve ductility, to remove uh, residual stress, uh, and to uh, get the dimensional stability. Um, uh, but oftentimes, uh, it, it also means that you want it soft so that you can do something with it and that you will heat treat it later. Uh, otherwise, you can leave it in the annealed uh, condition. H means uh, strain hardened. This refers to rot products only. Now, something to keep in mind about B221 is that it's a hot extrusion process. So uh, it doesn't impart much uh, for strain hardening. Uh, However, strain hardening can come from post-extrusion operations like stretching, bending, 
uh, or drawing. Um, so sometimes that goes into the uh, uh, into the property requirements that you're you're looking for. But as extruded, you typically uh, will not get a very high strain hardening strength. Uh, T tempers are the most common. Um, this means thermal or heat treated. Uh, these tempers um, are the most typical for uh, uh, for the most common alloys like uh, 6000 series alloys. Uh, so since I mentioned alloy families, let's uh, let's review those real quick too. Uh, in B221 and 221M, we have uh, several alloy families, several types of alloys, and they, they fall into different ranges. So 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 6, and 7,000 series alloys. These are all, so we have representatives of each of these families um, in B221. Um, Okay, some of these alloys are heat treatable, some are not. 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, these are not heat treatable. So these are either typically either in um, F or H temper, um, heat treatable. Uh, these are 2,000 series, 6,000 and 7,000. So these alloys are precipitation hardened. These are the most common in, uh, commonly used in hot extrusion mostly because you can get a product that is extruded in a very soft condition and then through heat treatment made to be very, very strong, which uh, works very well with, uh, with the hot extrusion process. So you can get these heat treated alloys. Uh, they're typically in FO or uh, T temper, most commonly in, in T. Um, now these are broken down into different types of heat treatment processes. Uh, we have a furnace solution heat treat process, uh, FSHT. Uh, these uh, are used for T3, T4, T6, T7, and T8 tempers. Okay, and then there's cooled from an elevated temperature process, uh, which in other words, you take a process where heat is generated as a result of the process, and it is just cooled from that process. And because these alloys are heat treatable, you still impart uh, it's usable, useful and usable properties. Uh, so these are T1 and T5. Uh, now, the press solution heat treated uh, is a process similar to cooled from elevated temperature process, but with using more controls, you can solutionize uh, and keep the product solutionized uh, by uh, processing it off of uh, off an extrusion press. And so you can use this in place of furnace solution heat treat on 6,000 series alloys for T3, T4, T6, T7, T8. Once again, if you have any questions um, on that part of it, uh, because it's not really in B221, uh, just let me know. I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, to help you out. Okay, <clears throat> now going back to uh, section nine. Section nine talks about how uh, how the products are to be heat treated and how this is controlled. This is a very important part of the standard. Uh, when we talk about having products that uh, perform the same, uh, even if they come from multiple uh, extruders, uh, this is the part where we want to make sure that we call out uh, the right process and the right controls that are used. So uh, for T1 and T5 products, uh, B221 references that these products are produced in accordance with B945. Now 945 is the standard practice for producing T1, T5 tempers, and it is a cooled from an elevated temperature shaping process. However, some of the alloys that are, uh, that are T5 um, and T1, they actually require some control. So you have alloys like 6005T5, and this is actually a, uh, this is a product that requires uh, strength and good process control. So um, the standard focus is that um, more on meeting the properties. It doesn't dictate the process as much, uh, but it still requires in order to make the properties for this product that you 
um, that you have good controls. So it really depends on the product. 6063 T5, for example, would not require the same level of control as 6005 does. All other uh, solution heat treated tempers, the default method is uh, the default process is uh, list given in AMS 2772. Now, um, 2772 is not in any of the ASTM standards, so just to give you a little bit more information. 2772 and ASTM uh, B918, these are furnace solution heat treat specs. So when we talk about furnace solution heat treatment, uh, these are the specs, uh, these are the standards that that, uh, uh, that have those procedures uh, given. The thing about uh, 2772 and the reason why it is the default is that it is the one that is typically used for aerospace products. So if you are using something for aerospace, the default is you would use this, this standard. However, for 6000 series, the default is ASTM B807. B807 is a press solution heat treatment spec. In other words, it has all the procedure and all, and all the controls uh, given for making a good product using the press solution heat treatment process. And it is the default for 6000 series. All right, so here's a little bit on uh, B807. Uh, it requires accuracy of temperature monitoring equipment. It recommends process parameters and outlines of procedures for press solution heat treat. Uh, it gives requirements for documenting process parameters and data retention. Um, and uh, I think the most important um, element of the standard is that it requires that uh, extruders that use this um, have to show that they meet the capability to produce the mechanical property requirements in accordance with EE uh, 2281. Uh, this is uh, basically what you would, you're doing is that you're showing statistical capability. It is the proof in the pudding that the process is under control. Now, even with that level of control, um, the purchaser may not want you to use that uh, standard. They, it is possible that you would specify the use of B918, the furnace solution heat treat spec listed for ASTM, uh, even for 6,000 series alloys. Um, it's, uh, it's not typical, but it's, it's, it's possible that you would want to do that. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, even if you use B807 and you use a press solution heat treat process, the uh, aging and aging equipment uh, requirements are still covered by B918. Okay, so um, when solutionizing using, even, even if you're using B807 to solutionize, now this has the B918 process has um, a lot of requirements for uh, for accuracy of temperature monitoring systems, uh, for uniformity of heat treatment furnaces. Uh, this is some of the uh, requirements for furnace surveys uh, and the frequency of the surveys. Um, and uh, so, and of course, it gives the practices, the, the soak times and uh, the temperatures uh, for the precipitation hardening process that is used even for, for B807. It also requires record retention for three years unless otherwise specified. Okay, moving on, uh, we have special, uh, the next sec sections uh, sections 10 through 14 uh, are special case testing requirements. Okay, these are built in quality checks regardless uh, of the purchasing language. In other words, uh, the purchaser doesn't specify this, but uh, this is uh, included when you um, purchase in accordance with this spec. Uh, section 10 is a producer confirmation of heat treat response. Uh, for certain higher strength alloys like 2014, 2024, and 6061 that are sold in an O or F temper, 
I don't know if you remember me saying, but sometimes you order higher strength products in an annealed or as produced um, uh, temper. Uh, so that you can later do your own fabrication and then solutionize it. But the producer still has to prove that the material, uh, if it were solutionized, would still uh, naturally age to a T42 property uh, level after four days. In other words, you're proving that even though you're not selling it in uh, a heat-treated condition, that it will still respond properly. And this is up to producer to, to prove as part of their quality control requirements. Then for alloys 2219, 7075, 7178, these are higher strength products. If they're sold in those O or F tempers, uh, then the producer must prove that if solutionized, uh, these would meet and, and heat treated, uh, that these would meet uh, T62 properties. So that requirement falls on the producer. Um, section 11 discusses more or less the same thing, but this is on as receives material. And it, all it states is that when the purchaser receives the material, well, this, and this, these are the same ones, 2014, 2024, 6061, and O and F temper, that if solutionized, that these are capable of meeting the properties. However, it does not require the purchaser to run the test. But if you do run the test, uh, the material has to uh, meet these requirements. Okay, so this is uh, just showing capability. Section 12 is uh, stress corrosion uh, resistance. Some of these alloys, uh, mostly 7000 series, 7075, 7178, uh, in certain tempers, these are, um, uh, it's, they have the potential for stress corrosion cracking. So you have to show that uh, they have the proper resistance, that they have been produced properly uh, and uh, do not um, do not have, well, that they have the res proper resistance to stress corrosion cracking. Uh, but it only applies to those alloys. Um, section 13 discusses an exfoliation corrosion, which is a special type of corrosion that 70, 75, and 71, 78 um, could be susceptible to. So you have to show that you're resistant to that. And then section 14 discusses cladding requirements for clad tubing. So this is a special product, very small uh, percent of the overall market, but uh, uh, when it is used, it has very um, high requirements and section 14 covers those. Moving on to section 15, uh, dimensional tolerances. Uh, this is the table that we discussed before. This lists all the tables um, for dimensional tolerances, the standard tolerances uh, for that exist um, in ANSI H35.2. And uh, once again, these tables do exist uh, in volume 202. So uh, this is included and this just tells you where to look uh, to find those standard tolerances. Uh, as you can see, it's a lot of tables because it covers uh, a lot of different uh, products and, and, um, and characteristics. Section 16 covers uh, general quality. Uh, it states that unless otherwise specified by the producer or by the uh, purchaser that the uh, extruded product uh, shall be supplied in mill finish and shall be uniform as defined by the requirements of the specification and shall be commercially sound. Uh, any requirement not so covered is subject to negotiation between the producer and uh, the purchaser. In other words, um, the, the standard is uh, mill finish if you want it to, to, uh, to come with a, a, a coating whether it be painted or anodized. Um, and that has to be called out uh, uh, separately. And uh, if there are any requirements uh, covered by another standard, then that also needs to be called out separately by, uh, by the purchaser. 
each uh, each product uh, shall be examined to determine conformance uh, to the specification with respect to general quality and identification marking. On approval of the purchaser, however, the pr producer or the supplier may use a system of statistical quality control for such examination. Now, this is put in because <clears throat> as statistical quality control became more popular, <clears throat> uh, there was a desire to uh, allow manufacturers to use statistical quality control um, or for purchasers to, uh, to specify. But it was decided that it, they did not want to make that a minimum requirement of the standard. So that's why 16.2 is there. And it's up to the purchaser to um, negotiate this with the uh, producer or for the producer to bring it up and, and, uh, and discuss with the purchaser. Uh, this, as covered in section four, uh, ultrasonic inspection and source inspection has to be uh, requested by the purchaser. Uh, ultrasonic inspection is covered under section 17, uh, internal quality, and this is for uh, thick, thicker parts. So if the, uh, the smallest dimension of one of these higher strength products is greater than, um, than a half an inch thick, then uh, it can be ultrasonically tested in accordance with ASDM B594. Uh, any other, uh, and that is, as I said, uh, as specified by the purchaser. Uh, source inspection is covered under <clears throat> section 18, and this is about uh, on site inspection of the, um, by the purchaser's representative. And uh, this section identifies the producer's responsibilities to facilitate the inspection or testing. It's a um, it's relatively short section, but it uh, it it does highlight the the basics of of a source inspection. But that is based on whether or not uh, the purchaser calls this out in the purchasing contract. So moving on, uh, section 19, retest and rejection. Um, section 19 states that if uh, any uh, material fails to conform to all of the applicable requirements, it is uh, actually to any or all of the applicable requirements is cause uh, for rejection. Um, uh, note that the uh, default requirement for rejected material is replacement of the material by the supplier. Uh, any requirement uh, for responsibility beyond that must be identified in the contract. Uh, in other words, if um, there's to be any kind of um, penalty for uh, shutting down operations or um, for cost to the uh, purchaser's um, uh, production, then that has to be called out. Otherwise, the only thing that is required as a basis is that the manufacturer will replace the material that was rejected. Sections 20 and 21 uh, cover identif identification marking and packing. These are uh, sections that um, have to be addressed by the purchaser. So when specified in the contract or purchase order, the product shall be marked uh, in accordance with Practice B666 uh, or B666M. Um, section 21 uh, covers packaging and package marking. And this uh, also, if identified by the purchaser that you want your product to be packaged uh, in accordance with the standard, it has to be called out. Otherwise, whatever requirements you have has to be uh, clarified um, otherwise, you're subject to the uh, producer standard packaging. So we're getting close to the end. Um, Section 22 certification is something that I want to be uh, uh, clear on as I, as I uh, uh, complete the, uh, the presentation. Um, the, the producer or supplier shall uh, on request, furnish to the purchaser a certificate stating that each lot has been sampled, tested, and inspected in accordance with the specification and has met the requirements. Now, that 
um, the thing is, if the purchaser does not ask for certification, then the product is tested and shipped without documentation. If you want the documentation that has to be specifically requested and called out in the uh, in the contract or the purchase order. Um, it is something that can be asked for later, uh, but uh, sometimes this is actually avoided because some people actually charge for the certification process. Uh, but uh, uh, certification is separate than testing. I just want to make that clear. However, uh, as per B807, the extruder must over time be able to show that they have the capability to produce desired tempers in accordance with ASTM E2281. And just quickly, what this means is that statistically, the producer has to show that they can make your product uh, within uh, with a 95% uh, confidence that 99% of material conforms to the strength requirements. All right, so uh, this is um, obviously this is a statistical uh, control, but it, what it does is it proves capability. It, you have, the producer has to show that uh, for a statistically significant amount of material that the average yield strength and tensile strength for the product must exceed, exceed the minimum strength requirements by three sigma. Uh, there's an example there, but if your, your mean is, uh, your mean has to be higher than the, uh, than the strength requirement by three sigma. And if you don't have good process control, that means that your mean just has to be higher, which makes it uh, more challenging. They have to prove that they can, they can meet that requirement. So in conclusion, B221 and 221M requirements are there to give the purchaser confidence that the product is produced to their expectations and it's consistent with the same products from another producer. Uh, the ordering information clarifies the pertinent issues at the time that the purchase order or contract is created in order to eliminate surprises or disputes after the product is delivered. So uh, at this point, I think um, I appreciate your attention. Um, Thank you, Greg. Oh, good. Okay, so uh, <laughs> so we do have a couple of questions that... Uh, oh. Uh, so burning, burning questions we have here. Okay. Um, let me start with the first one. I have had issues in the past with aluminum die castings where some elements were decreased in the melt or were different in thicker sections of the casting. Are there similar issues in extrusions or is the metallurgy more stable? Oh, uh, it is, it's not as, as different. Um, I, I, um, with extrusions as compared to uh, to castings, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, th there is sometimes a, 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 actually most of the differences that you, you have uh, in, in many cases are because of the usable portion of uh, chemistry range is uh, either at the bottom or the top of the range, uh, normally the bottom. And so um, the, any error in the testing uh, operation is usually what causes uh, the concerns, um, but uh, I think if you uh, if you look at uh, the chemistry of a given extrusion compared to the melt chemistry of the cast uh, for the billets that are used, uh, you will see small differences um, that are, are more than just the difference in the uh, the error of the instruments being used to uh, to test. Um, but I think you know it, those are relatively minor, uh, and it. Um, but that's why what we say is that we always go back to the melt ch chemistry as being the um, the reference chemistry, uh, and as long as the melt chemistry is in spec, then the extrusions are in spec, even if the actual chemistry of extrusions might uh, uh, might might vary just a little bit. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next question is, is there a direct relationship between strength and hardness for aluminum? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, um, it's a very good correlation between strength and hardness. I think um, uh, tensile testing strength uh, is 
the most accurate way to, to test strength. But yes, usually hardness, unless there is some kind of surface treatment, but typically uh, surface hardness uh, is directly uh, proportional or corresponds directly to uh, the strength of the material. I will uh, throw out a one caveat though, is most hardness tests just uh, are not as accurate as the tensile test. Um, and that's why we always reference uh, the uh, tensile test data and we use tensile tests for release criteria. Uh, you seldom will find hardness testing uh, as a uh, release criteria uh, in, in any standard. And if for B221, it's not. Okay. Is there another uh, question? Next, yeah, next question. Um, question about tolerances. The Aluminum Association standards, are they taken from the ANSI H35.2 you referenced? Yes, yes. Uh, H35.2 is the, um, uh, that's the source for Aluminum Association and um, ASTM and, and all of those. That is the, that's the foundation. So, um, so Aluminum Association pulls from the uh, ANSI uh, standard for that. Okay. Uh, next question, since there is only a minimum amount of strain hardening effect on the extrusion, the extruded parts are not wrought. Please comment. Oh, I mean, there's, there's still, there's, uh, I mean, there's still form, they're still considered wrought products. Uh, it's just that uh, because they are, um, I mean, you'd consider uh, hot processing uh, of something a wrought product. Um, just because it's done at an elevated temperature, uh, it still imparts some some um, amount of uh, deformation strengthening, uh, but not a lot. Not not as much as say cold working is my point. Okay, um, how would you recommend alloy chemistry be tested if not by spark testing with a standard traceable to NIST? Those, uh, I, I, I don't have it in front of me right now, but there are uh, uh, acceptable methods. Um, uh, spark testing of, um, say, an extrusion, um, you know, that, that's a reference type um, uh, testing, uh, which uh, as far as reference testing, that's not a big deal, but uh, say other processes would involve um, say uh, vaporizing an entire uh, volume uh, as opposed to just the surface uh, or uh, melting uh, a piece down and then checking the chemistry of, of the melt part. But those uh, uh, those processes are, uh, like I said, they are listed in B221. Um, and uh, it's, it's important that, that you, you look at those and if that doesn't work for you, then call out something that uh, that does between uh, between the purchaser and the producer. Okay, next question. What about the location of validity of mechanical properties? Should an extrusion meet mechanical properties across the entire location of the extrusion? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, as far as like the location, um, there's like where you take uh, take the sample and what is uh, representative of the extrusion. I think that's where purchasers need to understand their uh, their supplier's um, process. Uh, and uh, it really depends on the part as far as uh, what's the more, most appropriate uh, location to take samples from. Um, some, some producers actually take multiple samples uh, and use a screening process uh, to to find the most limiting component. Uh, some try to find the most representative uh, component. Um, like I said, uh, depending on the part and its use and and, um, uh, and, and specifics of you know uh, of the concerns over how the part is used, you know you might want to take a sample from the beginning from the middle of the run out, from the back end of the run out. The, I guess the point is the um, 
that part is left relatively vague in, in B221 because it, it wants to give the producer uh, and the purchaser um, the ability to specify the most appropriate location. Um, and not necessarily the most convenient, but the most appropriate. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, does standard B807 press solution heat treatment specify cooling medias for thicker profiles? Any concerns about internal walls of multi-hollow profiles? Could you re read the, uh, the first part of that again? Sure, does standard B807 press solution heat treatment specify cooling medias for thicker profiles? Actually, it, it specifies uh, cooling rates, um, uh, as, not, as opposed to medias. Whether you use water or whether you use air, um, I mean, some of those requirements, depending on the part, will dictate what the media is. Uh, but uh, one of the things about the standards is that, you know, since B07 was first written, the, uh, the equipment uh, manufacturers have uh, continued to increase the capabilities, the cooling capabilities of, of equipment. So it doesn't specify, well, with this part to make this, this temper, you have to quench it using water uh, because uh, some of the newer equipment, uh, you know, can do tremendous things with air or with air and mist or, or something like that. So, uh, so it really does try to dictate you need this cooling rate as a minimum, um, or you have to show that you're making the properties that you have the capability using the process that you use. Uh, but once you define the process and you show that you're capable, you have to continue to use that process. So uh, now it, uh, there are some prescriptive uh, requirements in B807, um, but there is still a little bit of uh, a wiggle room for um, advancements in the industry. Okay, um, we do have some more questions, but we are, we just are running out of time to get to them all. So, um, if it's, Greg, if you're, um, if you're amenable to this, uh, maybe we can re uh, address these questions kind of offline with the sure. people who have them. Sure, sure. I'm, 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 you want to email them to me? I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to. I'll shoot you back an answer uh, right away. All right, great. I will do that. All right, so thanks, Greg, for a terrific presentation. Uh, today's webinar will be available online soon on the AEC website, and we'll send you an email once it is uploaded. Uh, the evaluation survey for this webinar will be sent to you following this presentation, and please share your comments with us. Your input is very valuable and helpful in de uh, developing future webinars. The next webinar in our ex aluminum extrusion tech series is scheduled for June 15th and will cover a review of liquid and powder fluoropolymer coatings for architectural applications. Be sure to visit our website at aec.org webinars for more upcoming webinars on aluminum extrusions. Also, I want to tell you about a new educational event from AEC that you might be interested in. Extrusion Design University, or EDU18, is a new event that was created for designers, engineers, specifiers, and others who are interested in attending an in-person educational event to learn about a variety of extrusion design and process topics. EDU18 is scheduled for May 14th through 16th in 2018, about a year from now, and will include topics arranged in tracks covering architectural, automotive, and industrial applications of aluminum extrusions and related topics. The subjects covered in today's webinar, specifying aluminum extrusions, and the one I just mentioned on liquid and powder coatings, are the types of sessions you'll see at EDU18, along with exhibits from AEC extruder and supplier members who are knowledgeable and eager to answer your questions and offer assistance. For more information, visit aec.org slash edu18 and be sure to save the dates. Thanks, Greg, for presenting this webinar. To Futura Industry, thank you uh, for being our presenting sponsor. And to all of our AEC members, thank you. To find an extruder that matches your needs, 
Visit aec.org slash findextruder to use our handy online member search feature. This concludes our webinar. Thank you very much for being with us today.